Fine. Hello, Clarissa. Welcome everyone to the WMCS webinar for the Festival of Social Sciences. The WMCS is the Wizard Education Multi Cohort Study, and we're going to explain to you what that is and how that all works today. We'll tell you a little bit about what we've done in the past on the project over the past 10 years that it's been running and uh, what we can be doing in the future. So, first of all, we will introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Laura Arman, and I'm a research associate on the project at the moment. I am interested in Welsh language and language policy topics. Um, and next, I will hand over to Sally to introduce herself. Hey, yeah, thank, thanks, Laura. Um, I'm really delighted he to be here and talking about the, the Wizard Education Multi-Cohort Study. Um, I've been uh, involved in the cohort study since its very beginning, over 10 years ago now. Uh, Chris Taylor and I started up the study with the idea of providing a range of data uh, so that people could understand uh, the perspectives and experiences of young people growing up in Wales. Um, I'm currently co-director of WIZARD, and my interests are in education, education policy, and lots of things to do with social inequalities and education. And I'm going to hand over to Ria, not just now, but in terms of running the cohort study from next year. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Priyan Barrant. Um, I'm delighted to be um, taking over the study as principal investigator. Um, I'm now a lecturer in education at Cardiff, uh, but I started my career at Cardiff uh, six years ago now, I think, as a research assistant on the project. Um, so on the fifth sweep of the study, so I've seen a bit of how the, the study has developed um, over the last five years, and it's it's great to take over now in this 10th year, um, after all the great work that Sally and Chris have been doing and all the other researchers over the last um, decade. Um, so I think if we move on to the next slide. Um, so I'll just explain a bit of the aims of the study. So uh, the study aims to provide an insight into the perspectives and experiences of young people in Wales. Um, and the aspiration is to develop a source of comparable data that can be used to inform policy and practice. So we see the cohort study is a really important source of evidence. So it collects data about young people's views and experiences of growing up uh, in Wales. And it's a really kind of important um, resource from that perspective. Um, so the next slide. So a bit about how the study works. So it's a longitudinal study, which means that we track students as they progress through secondary school. So we have students starting in year seven uh, and then we follow them. We give them a survey, a questionnaire every year as they progress through secondary school. Uh, we have three different cohorts at any one time um, in schools. So, for example, a year seven, a year nine uh, and a year 11 cohort. So we can see we can ask questions and then we can get um, an idea of um, students experiences and perspectives depending on their age. Uh, but we can also see how that changes over time as they get older as well. So we give questionnaires every year um, and we sometimes do uh, questionnaires for teachers, not every year, but every few years we'll do uh, question is for teachers to get their perspectives on um, education and schooling uh, and we sometimes do interviews with head teachers as well um, and yeah and just to point out the funders we've had various funders over the last 10 years who are listed below we move on to the next slide so we're now in the 10th year celebrating the 10 year 10th, 10th anniversary of the project um, so we've had 10, 10 sweeps of data and we have three cohorts every year um, and usually we have around 1,000 or 1,500 pupils in every sweep, um, which provides a really good overview of um, data. So we've got secondary schools across Wales, we've got children um, in rural and urban schools um, across north, south, um, west, east Wales and mid Wales. So we've got a really good overview of schools in different areas and the different experiences and perspectives that children um, in different parts of the country will have. Um, so we do this through online questionnaires. So every year we ask um, schools to sit the cohorts down and ask um, students to do a questionnaire uh, every year. Um, and these questionnaires can be on lots of different things. So broadly about uh, growing up in, in Wales, um, a lot of the questions are on about half our questions every year on educational experiences, school life. Um, but we also ask a series of questions around things like um, that are relevant at a particular times. So things like uh, 
the pandemic, uh, climate change. Um, we ask a lot about political engagement um, and a lot about the Welsh language as well. So we have um, a good number of schools, of Welsh language schools in the study as well. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, so just to give a quick overview of um, the participants in each sweep of the data. So yeah, in the first year we had year six pupils, but since then we've uh, kept it with secondary school uh, pupils. So you can see um, in the 10th sweep, we had pupils in year eight, 10 and 12, and we had over a thousand pupils. So it's a bit of a dip during the pandemic, uh, but generally we're around um, a thousand or over a thousand pupils. Uh, in recent years in each sweep. Um, yeah, if we move on, and um, this just gives you uh, an overview of which cohorts we've had in each sweep. So um, in sweep, uh, so we've got, we yeah, we give each cohort, uh, we label each cohort, and this enables us to do analysis so we can see how um, views and experiences changes as we go through time and what year group each group were. Um, so the way that it works is so um, at the start of every school year, um, it varies, but usually towards the end of autumn, we start recruiting um, schools. So um, we have we have schools that have been with us from the start um, and then we um, occasionally um, and then we also recruit new schools as well. So that's so we recruit schools. Uh, we design the questionnaire. So we have questions that go in every year because of the longitudinal aspect. We want to see how views and experiences change over time. Um, but as I said, we also have uh, questions that we put in depending on particular issues. So at the moment, we're developing uh, questions around the new curriculum and how we can evaluate the new curriculum in Wales. Um, we do con consultation with a range of stakeholders, um, very carefully translate the um the survey to make sure that it's um, appropriate for children in Welsh medium schools and each child has access to because um, they do it online so they can do they can switch between the Welsh and English version whatever they're comfortable most comfortable in um, and we that, then we after the development of station translation we release the questionnaire um, and going through head teachers deputies or heads of year pupils complete the questionnaire um, and then we uh, so that's usually in uh, the beginning of, um, so around February, February, March, April, pupils generally uh, completing the questionnaire. Uh, at the start of summer term, usually we close the study um, and then we go through the data um, through a process called data cleaning um, before we can do uh, the data analysis. Um, and then the real benefit for schools of being part of the study, I think, is that we provide um, general and school level reports um, which we give before we start the next recruitment drive. So um, we give a sample of children's responses so you can see how responses in your school um, compare um, with the overall responses um, across across the cohorts, um, which schools have said is really valuable for them um, in terms of kind of planning and understanding um, the, and understanding their schools and how things are working. And um, since we started move, moving to the online version as opposed to visiting schools as we used to, that relationship with the teachers has been um, really important because they're the ones who are uh, sort of the, the communication points with the pupils for us uh, nowadays. So yeah. uh, maintaining those relationships over these 10 years has been a challenge, especially with COVID and everything. So in the school recruitment process, um, we are constantly having to chase up new email addresses as schools change their communication systems and uh, sort of retaining those schools, uh, as I say, has been challenging, but we've got people who've been with us for many years who have really been vital in helping us to run the survey since, since it went online. Yes, I mean, I have to say, we, we really couldn't do it without those schools. So we gain a lot out of, of their cooperation. And I think they also gain quite a lot too. I know particularly those that have been with us since the beginning, they find the feedback they get from how their students feel about their school and their relations with their teachers really useful. In fact, some of them have found it very helpful um, in various, in, when they've been discussing with EST in their practices. So hopefully it's a mutually beneficial experience. Great, thanks. Um, and yeah, so if we look at so these are example questions on um, some different issues. So uh, during COVID, 
we asked um, whether people think that there's more disruptive paper behaviour in the classroom now than there was before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, on the Welsh language, we've asked, do you think the Welsh language helps people to find a job, put in more at work, put in more in higher education, to get kind of general attitudes towards uh, the Welsh language um, and the role it, the, that students feel it will play in their lives. Um, and then we've asked general questions about poverty. So what do you think is the worst thing about being poor for young people? So we're quite sensitive in the way that we phrase questions as well. So some questions we think it's too uh, sensitive to ask children about directly, for example, if they've been um, come to school hungry. So we ask and said, um, do you know if any pupils in your school come to school hungry? So we're quite sensitive in the way that we phrase questions um, as well and sensitive to those issues. Um, so those are just some examples. Um, yeah, if we move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so just to show you this year's topics, and you can see the kind of range of issues that we look at. So we've looked at um, children's uh, perspectives um, and engagement around climate change. So whether they've been to um, a climate protest, uh, whether they've made lifestyle changes to their lives and how worried they are about climate change. Um, we've asked a lot of questions with huge amount of um, data around the Welsh language, um, more generally about their attitudes to the Welsh language, but also um, about Welsh language in school, particularly for Welsh language um, schools, that data is very useful. Um, and then uh, there's been a broader research project that Sally and Chris have been um, leading around um, attendance and exclusions. Um, and that's produced some really interesting uh, insights and data. So we've asked questions this year about attendance and exclusions, and we have done over the last few years. There's questions around mental health, um, around poverty, uh, voting and politics. We have a lot of questions around um, young people's political engagement um, with like broader political institutions, like what they think about voting, but also participation in protest uh, and social movements and things like that. Um, and this year we've asked about kind of more difficult questions like uh, racism, whether their school talks about racism, whether they um, see racism in their local community, these kind of issues. So, um, yeah, so this is a really kind of important issue that, um, so yeah, you can see there's kind of a huge range of uh, kind of questions that we ask about. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide. Thanks, thanks Rian, that's that's great. What I'm gonna do next is just to, to briefly go through some very headline findings, I think from the sweep 10 that we've done this year. Over the next few weeks, we'll be refining our findings and we'll be developed every year. We develop a series of postcards, which Laura will be talking about soon. Um, but we thought you might be interested just for now in having a kind of just a glimpse of some of our findings. Now, my computer went down then. Oh, no. <laughs> Did everyone's or just mine? I think just yours, but yeah, it was only for a second. Okay, sorry about that, folks. All right, let's pick up. This is just a brief glimpse of some of the findings. Uh, we know there's a real concern about absenteeism in schools since COVID, and we've been trying to, to chart young people's experience and anxieties about COVID, and we can see that absenteeism continues to be an issue and disrupts their, their school life. So nearly two thirds of our young people were actually off over the last academic year because of COVID related, either they had COVID or they were forced to isolate at home. Um, there are also obviously other illnesses are around now. Uh, a significant number of quarter were asked by the school not to come in, presumably because there was COVID in that, in that class or that year group. But less frequent but very important is nearly 20% of the pupils who are absent because of anxiety and mental health issues. Uh, and we know that is a growing area of concern. And 16% of the pupils didn't want to come back to school. So it's a really, there are real anxieties about how young people are readjusting to school life in, the, in trying to get back to normal. Next slide, please. Okay, we also know that one of the reasons they're particularly anxious is because they have lost teaching time and a significant proportion, the majority of uh, students, it's certainly the older students, believe that their 
uh, learning has suffered a lot. The overwhelming majority think their suffer their uh, learning has suffered a small, you know, a little bit. But the the number that uh, think it's suffered a lot increases greatly the older students get, which is perhaps not surprising given that they've got their uh, really important exams coming up. So well over fifty percent of students think that their learning suffered a lot because of because of COVID related disruption. Next slide, please. We also we were concerned to find out the extent to which uh, young people were experiencing poverty at school, and there clearly are real grounds for concern here. We've known for a long time, and, and this year's evidence supports it, that some families really uh, struggle to enable their children to go on school trips, trips that are very important for their broadening their educational experience. And a third um, of, the, of the young people in the survey knew of fellow pupils who were just not able to afford to go on school trips. We also know that school uniform is a real problem for families struggling financially. And again, over 20% knew of fellow pupils who couldn't uh, afford the school uniform, something which is, is being tackled at the moment through a, a government consultation. Perhaps even more alarmingly is the extent to which there appears to be issues around hunger and young people. So nearly a third of our students knew of fellow students coming to school hungry and about the same proportion knew of fellow students who couldn't afford to buy lunch at school. So there's clearly a real challenges around how schools cope uh, with, with, with students coming to school that, coming to school hungry and not being able to, to get food during the day. Next slide, please. Just, uh, I think, when, uh, just kind of finally talking about um, issues, how schools deal with difficult issues. We were concerned to find out whether schools were engaging, uh, particularly in some of the issues around decolonization and race and racism. So we asked young people whether their school encouraged them to discuss issues around race and racism. And you might say that it's quite positive because this is, you know, nearly half the students uh, say that their school did, did encourage them to talk about issues of race and ra racism. On the other hand, half said that, or were unsure whether that was the case. Next slide, please. We see though that there's really significant school-wide variation in the extent to which schools do encourage uh, their students to talk about race and racism. So some schools, uh, it's near, so over 70% of young people say their school uh, encourages them to discuss it. In other schools, it's uh, less than a quarter. We also asked about whether they specifically discussed Black, the Black Lives Matter movement. And here you see that the school level difference is really starkly illustrated. So that one school, for instance, fewer than 10% of pupils said that Black Lives Matter had been discussed, whereas another school, it's nearly 90%. So there's clearly significant school-wide variation in, in how either how comfortable or how uh, schools are in engaging with these discussions. Relatedly, we ask, also asked whether their school took reports of racism seriously. And again, you, you might say this is encouraging because overall, the overwhelming majority, over 80%, agree that their school does take reports of racism seriously. On the other hand, if you dig down in a little bit more depth, you can see that it's, it's not quite that uh, straightforward so that we looked at the extent to which there was a difference of opinion between white pupils and those from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. And here you can see quite a stark difference. So that while most agreed um, they were schools took issues of racism, reports of racism seriously, these were black students were far more likely to disagree. In fact, more than twice as likely to disagree. So that 14% of white pupils disagreed um, and 37% of black, black, Asian and minority ethnic students uh, felt that their schools did not take reports of racism seriously. And I think this is me up next. So I as, think we'll leave that with you. <laughs> as my research interest is uh, Welsh language predominantly or uh, language issues in general, 
um, I've managed to include quite a suite of questions about the Welsh language at school and at home uh, in this year's, uh, in, sorry, in Sweet Ten's uh, questionnaires, which uh, the results of which are just sort of coming out now. Um, and so here's a preview of some of those, although there is a broader picture um, that we've managed to create with all the questions that we've asked. So um, almost two thirds of the pupils thought it was important to learn to speak Welsh. Um, and that is more than reports being able to speak Welsh according to this uh, round of data so far. Um, so um, more people want to learn the language than can speak it currently. Um, whereas only 15.4% felt that it was not at all important. So these are the people with the strong opinions that it's not at all important to learn to speak Welsh. Um, so generally encouraging, but there's still work to be done there on attitudes towards the Welsh language at school, particularly with the Welsh Government's Cymraeg 2050 goal of increasing the number of Welsh speakers and improving um, people's ability to speak Welsh whilst they're at school in general. 88.3% um, of pupils, on the other hand, felt that Welsh was at least a little helpful when finding a job. So even if um, they feel it's not at all important for them to learn to speak it themselves, they do think it's important for finding future jobs, presumably in Wales. Um, and 45% uh, agree, 45.9% rather, agree completely um, that it's useful in finding a job, whereas 30.2% feel that it's somewhat useful when finding a job. And of course, we asked about other categories such as, is it useful to go to university? Is it useful for uh, fitting in at the workplace uh, and so on as well? So this is just a little preview of, um, of our results here. Um, what we do with all of this information is we produce reports for the schools, as Fianna already mentioned, um, and uh, these reports encompass uh, all of our key findings and we break them down by school uh, and then we also have um, the figures for all of the schools together so each school can compare uh, how they're doing in comparison to the study as a whole um, and uh, those key findings uh, are also presented uh, sort of side by side so that they can make the comparison directly so here's an example of what that looks like um, this graph was featured in one of our reports for Sweep 9, which was the last, the year before last in terms of academic years. Um, so uh, because it was a COVID year, we didn't have uh, our higher numbers of participants. We had 833 pupils responding to this particular question uh, in total. And um, from this school, which I've invented, uh, we had 110 responses because, of course, all of our data is anonymous when it comes down to the school level. Um, so only your school will find out what your school's results are, whereas all of the data together we take and um, produce our own uh, analyses of without naming who the schools participating are. I think you saw on Sally's slide earlier that each of them, each of the schools was coded differently in a way that makes them not identifiable. Um, so where was I? Here's one of the graphs from Sweep 9 um, from the school reports. Uh, in purple, we have the results for all of the schools. So that's kind of the, um, the percentage average for those responses across all schools. And so it's things that can be relevant to uh, the school day itself, or it can be a key finding from what's going on more broadly within the pupil population. This graph is about uh, the, the pupils' thoughts on whether the teachers made the lessons interesting, and this came from a suite of questions on COVID specifically. So it was about their online learning experience and then their experience of going back into the classroom. So uh, my teachers made the lessons interesting. Uh, we can see that most schools, which are in purple, um, had the response of neither agree nor disagree. Um, and then uh, that's also the case for your school, this school in particular that we're looking at here. Um, but they had somewhat agree as being a very close figure to that. So they're doing slightly better on the pupils somewhat agreeing that the lessons are interesting as compared to all of our schools in general. 
um, but overall pretty similar. So this school can be reassured that um, they're doing about the same as everyone else. Um, so that's how our school reports work. And as I say, they get that over, over a bunch of key, key findings. We also have outputs um, of our key findings in the form of postcards. Um, and we also produce reports, and these are all available on the Wizard website, which is what this screenshot here has been taken from. Um, so the Wizard website, we have uh, news, blogs, uh, reports, also academic articles, and you can search for them all there. Um, we publish these postcards um, to as sort of a an accessible way to look at our key findings from each sweep. Um, and so they have uh, graphics and uh, easier to read tables and graphs and things like that. Um, uh, here's an example from uh, sweep nine again, which was uh, our sort of more COVID focused um, questionnaire. And of course, these postcards are produced bilingually um, as is everything else on the website. Um, so I will point you to that at the end of this session so that you know where to find this kind of information. So uh, the schools get our key findings and some, a more limited set are also um, made available publicly in, an, in a way that's easy to understand. Um, we also, uh, as well as just sort of producing the, the school level findings, we also break things down by year to sort of look at different trends um, within the, the questions. Um, so Sally's presented some of those for you already and the key results from this year. Um, but here I just wanted to emphasize that we do look at different demographics um, and how different aspects of their school life has, have, has, have affected different school years of pupils. We also collect data um, on gender or sex, depending on which year it was. Um, we collect gender on ethnicity. Um, we also, a national identity as well. And we also um, have been asking whether the pupils uh, receive free school meals as uh, an indicator for us, although that might have to change in the coming years if the uh, school meals are made free more broadly in secondary schools as well as primary, primary we'll see. Um, and of course, we have information on geographic location, which also tells us something about the economic status of the schools and the pupils who attend the schools. Uh, and that's all information that's um, more broadly available anyway. Um, other research outputs that we have is in the form of academic research. As I've mentioned, that's all available on the Wizard website as well. This screenshot shows you sort of how, it, how to find it, what it looks like. Um, and the academic research publications will be usually linked to the original journal article where the research appears. Um, we produce reports and briefings as well. And uh, those again can be found in the same place. And that's sort of a more um, public reading friendly uh, breakdown of our results. And it sort of has got more contextualization than our school reports where we give uh, more of a commentary of the uh, analysis of various findings. Um, and then we also have things like seminars and collaborative meetings. So um, you can sign up to the wizard mailing list by the website as well and, and keep an eye on future developments and uh, be kept abreast of what we're doing uh, by, by sort of following us on there. Um, we also hold meetings with Welsh Government and Senate committees. Uh, Sally, would you like to explain a bit more about these? Well, we Welsh Government actually are, are, are funding us at the moment and will be funding us in the next couple of years. So which is a really important way of us making sure that our findings feed into policy development. So we regularly meet with people from uh, Knowledge and Analytical Services and the Education Directorate uh, to discuss how we can uh, feed information into them that might help them shape their policies. So that, for instance, uh, we put some questions in this year on how young people feel about changing the school year, which we know is, is a policy they're, they're considering at the moment. 
and we will also be liaising with some of the some of the uh, committees that serve the Senate uh, that who are interested in following the progress, some of the key reforms, particularly the new curriculum. Thanks. Yeah, and this year we included some questions on climate based on consultation with various groups and and so on. Um, so now we get on to the the ten year study. Um, so the longitudinal aspect of the project. Uh, recently, a former colleague, Ed James, put together a report which will be published on the Wizard website in the coming weeks, um, looking at the questions that we have asked over the course of the 10 different sweeps um, and examining what trends we can find uh, within those uh, different, different cohorts. Um, so this is kind of... Um, a brief preview of the kind of things that we've been able to do because of the wealth of data that the project has uh, and keeps over the years. And I should mention that this has also been done in collaboration with our data team um, who are based here in, in Spark with us. Um, so yes, the trends that uh, we have found so far uh, are not looking the most encouraging for the pupils. Uh, we have questions such as, how much do you agree with these statements about school? And then various statements about school that the pupils can agree or disagree with. And those have been asked over the course of um, several different sweeps. Um, so this one in particular is, I look up to my teachers. And you can see that um, fewer and fewer people, pupils agree with this over the years. Um, and more and more pupils disagree with it. So it's not that they're more... Um, uh, it's not that they're less decisive, it's that they are actively disagreeing with, with these statements. Um, so here, there's a smaller percentage of pupils who said that they always look up to their teachers and a higher proportion who now say they never look up to their teachers. Um, and the response rates you can see at the bottom there, we don't have the two years that were um, heavily impacted by COVID. But um, from all the other years, we have uh, 1,000 responses, 750 in one case. Um, so we're dealing with a fair bit of data here. It's looking like this is uh, a, a real trend, and we're going to have to do more analysis of, of this sort of thing in future. Um, one of the advantages of having this data to look back on uh, is that we can also use it to look at the um, four purposes of the new curriculum for Wales. Um, so for example, here I picked out an example um, which talks about confidence, which is one of the um, sort of subheadings of the four purposes. So to produce happy and confident pupils, I think was, was the wording. Um, and so here we've gone back and looked at uh, our question, um, how much do you agree with the following statements? My school encourages me to be more confident. And as you can see, we've got agree to disagree as the scale here. Um, and so what we can do is continue to track these um, data points to con continue to track these trends uh, by asking, by repeating these questions that are relevant to the new curriculum again uh, in the coming years of the WMCS. Um, so we can build a better picture of what's going on uh, in any given topic of the four purposes. Right, was there anything else to add on the new curriculum? I don't think so. I think it's clearly something where we can be of real value to the Welsh Government, uh, but obviously it's early days yet. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely an aspect that we're going to be developing further and going to be um, developing those questions over the next few months. Right. So I think that brings us to the end. Um, and I just wanted to let you know where to find our work. So there's uh, the data portal is where we have a store of our questions. Um, and you do need to uh, create a login, but you don't need to do, uh, you don't need to be a member of any particular institution to be able to do that. It's a simple sign up procedure. Um, and then you can uh, search through our questions and obviously the interface is available in English and Welsh. I'm just now realizing this is my screenshot, so it's in Welsh. Um, but uh, you can sort through the questions, see what we've been asked, see how it's been asked. 
In some cases, um, you have a full set of data. In other sets, it was only asked of specific cohorts. So we asked um, exam questions of pupils in year 10 uh, during uh, sweep nine, for example. So um, it will be empty for the years that we didn't ask the exam questions of, the school years, I mean. Um, but you get an idea of the breadth of questions that have been asked by checking this data portal. So the address is down there at the bottom, data.wizard.ac.uk. Um, and uh, this is something that's in development. Uh, the, a new interface will be introduced over the next year or so. Um, and sort of how the data is presented may change as well. But for the moment, you can go and explore what we have and feel free to email us to uh, find out more or to find out how that works. Um, our own website, of course, is wizard.ac.uk. And I just wanted to make sure that I got that in there before uh, thanking you for listening to our seminar. Yes, thank you very much. And I do hope that you will continue to be interested in the cohort study. And if we should approach your school to be involved, that you'll say yes. Yep, thank you very much. Hopefully we'll get um, more involvement from more schools going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.